I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. Art is such an odd thing because how much you love something and how much you put into it doesn't have any relevance to how well you're doing. You know, I mean, I was in a great guns, body and soul. I, I, I love my songs. I love my music. I was into it. I stunk, but who cared? I was so, so into it. And it's just a, such a love. And when I realized, wait a minute, if I ever want to eat, you know, I'm making $80 a week on a good week and I'm 31 years old. And I, I said, well, look, I know all these jokes. Let me try telling these jokes on stage. And they laughed and I told more and they laughed some more and they made an album. And, you know, I went like this. I mean, I was crawling and crawling and then, you know, I sent my albums to Howard and he called me up and I went in and sat in on the show and they said, you're a lot of fun. Come back next week. And I worked there once a week for free for three years. I mean, I put in, paid my dues, you know, and it was so it was gradual, gradual, gradual. And eventually, all of a sudden, I'm rich. Well, I, I think, though, an important lesson is that you were willing to do it for free for three years. I think people aren't willing to put in the free. Waiting for Jackie Martling. Jackie, come on on. Come on up to the stage. This is Jackie the Joke Man Martling. Welcome to the James Altucher Show. Where, where are you guys from? Union City. Union City, New Jersey. And where are you from? This building? You from, like, right around here? All right. Welcome to this comedy festival. Rich, this is great. You're having... Sold out crowd. Don't look around. It's a sold out crowd. Trust me. <laughs> Jackie the Joke Man Martling. Have a seat. It I looks like a full house, Mr. Trump. I told them not to look around. It is a full house. So, first off, let me just introduce you, if I may. You might know him from his 18 years he spent writing jokes as the joke man on the Howard Stern Show. Yeah, guilty. You've, you've, you've had your own radio show about jokes after that on Sirius XM. You've done, all, so you've done a billion different things. You wrote jokes for Rodney Dangerfield. You, ha, you still have a joke phone line. Uh, 516, what's the number? 516-9221, celebrating our 40th year of making no money. 
Your latest book, The Joke Man, Bow to Stern. The Joke Man, Bow to Stern, is selling into the dozens. And uh, the feedback's really good. And uh, it's been out about a year and a half. And I, I love it. It's uh, it's audiobook and Kindle. And I guess, is Kindle the generic word for ebook, yeah, whatever e-book, it is? Whatever. And hardcover. And, uh, and people keep discovering it and keep texting and emailing and. And it's really fun. And there's a documentary on me coming out in the fall, which is really exciting because we're going to take it to all the film festivals and then do the Q&As and the whole thing. Film festivals are really fun, but they're a whole different level if you're actually in a film or have contributed to something. I mean, like, do, you get, do you get anxious? Like, are you going to win a prize? No, nah, well, you never know. You know, there's so many film festivals now, like even the crummiest little movie has 19 of those little golden palms above it and say, wow, look at this, you know, and it's the best on my block, you know. What's, when you say there's a documentary about you, like, what's, what does it cover? Like, what do you... It covers me. It's like soup to nuts, the whole deal. You know, I interviewed a million different people and have clips of everything. And you know, I've lived a lot of lifetimes, you know. I should have been dead four or five times already, you know. Like, we'll, we'll get to that. But what, what... The death part or... The, the death part, definitely. The death is, is more interesting than life. So nothing is as interesting as your haircut. <laughs> Could be. Uh, so you really, you're really a great example. You don't have to like, everybody's so anxious these days. What should, I, what should I do when I grow up? What should my passion be? How do we overcome the sounds of like the restaurant closing up here? And you, you kind of like found your own path in this zigzag way. Like you were into music, you were playing bands, and then and, and maybe you weren't that good, and so you started telling jokes to keep the crowd you know, excited. It, it's, what's really wacky is if you take my life and go backwards and connect the dots backwards, it makes perfect sense. It looks, it looks like I had a plan and knew exactly where I was going and what I was doing, and it was absolutely haphazard. I mean, the best description of my life pattern is a pinball, you know, bing, 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 bing. You know, I just did the next thing I had to do because I had to do it. And uh, a little bit of bad luck, but a real lot of good luck. And the main thing you find out in life is that luck is a huge part of it, but also really favors the prepared. So if it, you know, if you're ready for it and you've set yourself up, you know, all the, uh, all the opportunity in the world is no good if you're not ready to go, you know? So, Jack, it's, it's an interesting thing because you've made your living and your name from... A- anybody would love to be doing it. To basically telling and writing jokes, making people laugh. That's like a dream come true for, for anybody. You know, it's like anybody's job. It sounds like a lot better than it is. And, uh, and it really is great. But the insecurity that comes, I, I, you know... There's no way to gauge your life with somebody else's. So for all I know, everybody here is as insecure as I am. But when you're an entertainer or a comedian, I know every time somebody says, what are you doing? I say, I'm a comedian. I'm waiting for somebody to tap me on my shoulder and say, what are you talking about? No, you're not. You know what I mean? Because uh, it's, it's a, a pompous calling, but... Why, why is it a pompous calling? Well, you know, you do make people laugh, and you make people laugh for, for you, so many decades. You eventually decades. find out that you can do it. You know, uh, it, it, it's it's really crazy because every time you look back a couple of years and you realize how much better you've gotten, you're like, how the hell did I have the nerve to get on stage then? How I got on stage to tell jokes in 1979, I you know, I you know, had to be crazy. So like you, once you started telling jokes on stage, you pretty quickly turned professional with it. You were writing jokes well, no, for Ronnie Dangerfield. It, it was the oddest situation. I was in, I love telling this story. I was a, I was a musician until I was um, 31 years old. And that's when I quit music. And Rodney Dangerfield's old joke was, uh, I was 31 when I quit music. And to give you an idea how well I was doing, I was the only one who knew I quit, <laughs> okay? <laughs> So uh, I was in a three-man band, and we were very fun. We had a 1955 bright yellow Cadillac hearse. We traveled around Long Island, and we smoked pot, and we got laid, and we drank, and we had a lot of, lot of fun. The only thing we forgot to do was get famous, and we really weren't any good. And at, one night after a show in 1978, 
We're a three-man band. Three-man band. And after the show, we're, I, I say we were in the dressing room. We were in the, in the room where they keep all the beer. And the other two guys said to me, Jackie, we're going to leave the band and start our own band. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. So if there's gonna... three guys in the band and two of them leave to start their own band, that's kicking me out of the freaking band. Come on, let's call a spade. But I didn't care because I was telling all the jokes. We told jokes and did original songs, and I had all these millions of jokes. I, I knew all the jokes by the mid-'70s. I mean, I've known all these jokes. That I didn't just decide I want to be a comic and go learn some jokes. I mean, these have been built into my soul for whatever godforsaken reason for my entire life. They just stuck to me. And I got, you know, I have an engineer's mind and I love them and I love the, can you make that a little louder, you prick? <laughs> and, uh, and you just, I, I, they were just all in my head. So I, I, I was done with music and I certainly wasn't gonna get a job because I was a hippie and I was out of my mind. It's like 1979. And uh, so I started telling jokes on stage. And I used to play guitar by myself. When I was breaking up with my band, I started playing guitar by myself and doing shows, you know, in bars. I'd tell jokes and play songs. And I met a bunch of comics on Long Island. And it was so early in the game, there was no place to do comedy on Long Island. So the other comics used to come to where I was playing so they'd get some stage time. Like Eddie Murphy came to, and Bob Nelson, okay. Rob Bartlett, guys you've heard of. Wait, so Jackie, so Eddie Murphy, was he like, like, how old was he then? Like, he was, was he was such a kid. You know, I did, everybody knew each other, but not that well. But he was absolutely, unbelievably pompous and sure of himself at like 16, 17 years old. He, he actually used to say, I'm going to be bigger than the Beatles. And then he became bigger than the Beatles. Yeah, made when he, so crazy. I think when he had only been doing stand-up for about seven he, years. He, in the beginning, he wasn't, he wasn't funny in the very beginning. But yeah. like after only seven years, he did, I think, Raw, which was like the biggest comedy special ever at that time. Oh, you no, know, he, he took off like a rocket ship. You know? So he, what do you think about... There was an opening on Saturday Night Live, and you know they want an African-American guy, and somebody said, why don't you grab Eddie? And they tried Eddie, and pow, and he went, just went to the moon, you know? Like, could you, at any point, could you see, oh, he flipped a switch, he got great. He went from, like, being mediocre to great. No, you know, he, he was okay, but he was just so natural that when they plugged him into Saturday Night Live, he was absolutely natural, you know? He, it's, it's weird, he just, he, he was just good. You know, he used to do old Richard Pryor albums, and then he stopped doing those and started saying his own stuff, and he was, and he just grew, and just got big. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't even paying attention, you know? I had an album out and I was recording my second album at a club on Long Island called East Side Comedy Club. And the mics were set up and, uh, and Eddie came up to me and said, Jack, you do another album? I said, yeah. He said, I want to have an album. And I said, I'm sorry, Eddie, I'm too busy. <laughs> so that's part of the bad luck along the way, you know, not even, you know, who knows, but you know, it, it's, People just grow. People just shoot up. They go nuts. You know? So, but you've seen a lot of these people kind of grow grow up, or or or, or even as a grown up succeed. Like Ronnie Dangerfield, how old was he when he switched to stand up? He was like aluminum siding. No, no, he was uh, he was always show business, show business, and he dropped out so he could feed his family for about twelve years. But it was always in his heart, and he was always writing jokes. And then he and then he came back and did it. You know. But he, you know, he was a case. You know, he was, the, he, they, they broke the mold with him. He was unbelievable. But, it, uh, you know, they, it, In what sense, like, what would you say, like, if you saw, like, what was, what was the unbelievable factor? Because it was just such a strong, what he was, as good as his jokes were, he was a strong entity. You know, he, the jokes fit him and he fit the jokes. You could, that, that character was so strong. You know, it was like, and it was, and it, and it just so, sucked in everybody because it's, uh, it's, all of us feel sorry for ourselves. And that was basically, you know, 180 pounds of somebody feeling sorry for themselves, you know, and, he, and it worked and it worked big time. Did he ever, I mean, whenever you see him on TV or movies or anything, he's always that same character. Did he ever break that character no, in real no, life? That, that was that guy. You know, I mean, in, in real, you know, like, he, did he feel like he, he got was no so respect? much fun to be around, but not for the right reasons. You know, he, because uh, he, 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 it's always like, I can't relax, you know, I can't relax. I can never relax, you know. I smoke a joint, smoke a cigarette, you know, that's all, I, I can't relax. You know? But, you know, what's interesting to me, though, is that a lot of comedians, like you just said, Eddie Murphy was doing Richard Pryor's albums. 
Rodney Dangerfield was was looking at your jokes and he had other people writing jokes for him. How much, you know, so he had this persona. Were you all sort of writing jokes no, for that, that persona? No, that whole persona was his. The people, like, I contributed a joke here and there and other comics would give him a joke here and there. But that whole persona was just the creation of something that, you know, he started when he was 15 and he just was at it for so long and he was so beaten down and uh, and then he got, got the Rodney Dangerfield name and nobody can agree on where that came from. And uh, and then, you know, he, he, a few Ed Sullivans and the Dean Martins. And when I started hanging out with him for the brief period, he had just made, was in the middle of making Caddyshack. But the important thing is he was on the Carson show like maybe twice a year or three times a year for almost the entire 70s. And he was on the Dean Martin show once a month or something. But as often as that sounds like, you know, he's on TV and he does seven minutes. So you don't see him again for a couple of months. In the early, at the early eight, in the early 80s, just at the end of the 70s, they put him in a whole series of Miller Lite beer commercials. And he was in Miller Lite beer commercials with all these, you know, not Mickey Mantle, but that level, you know, you know, hockey players, football players, baseball players, and they'd always be doing something, drinking Miller Lite, and he was like the butt of the jokes. But those things were on every five minutes on every channel, and he said, it's crazy, you know, everybody knows me, you know, 15 years doing this, and now everybody knows me, hey, Rodney, hey, Rodney, because they saw him on TV 10 minutes earlier. You know, so the recognition factor went to the moon, you know. So do you think that kind of fame has is is over in the sense that you know back in the 70s 80s even the 90s you know the seinfeld finale had 26 million viewers now uh, a top 10 show might have a million viewers yeah no so the, the whole thing is is very four percent very, of the viewers it's very crazy it's so the whole thing is so scattered i just had a meeting today and a guy was explaining to me about there's there's stars that are selling out you know 12,000 seat arenas because they have so many YouTube followers and they're people you never heard of. And are they funny? Well, they got like 12 minutes of material that's not funny. And they, pa and they pack rooms across the country and you never heard of them. It's like, that's the new game, you know? It's not, it's, who knows? Who okay, knows where it's going? Let me ask you a question. Do you know who the highest paid YouTuber was last year? You. No, <laughs> far from it. Does anyone here know who the highest paid YouTuber was last year? No, don't, don't, is it the, the little kid that opens up the packages? Yes, Ryan. Is that the, well, See, yeah, yeah, See, see Ryan is seven years old and he just plays with his toys and other kids watch and he made $22 million last year. It's so hard to believe the kid has 5,000 friends. In real no, life, they're no, all at this door. Let's go. Hey, we want to come out. 200 million friends. He Facebook, he's limited to 5,000. YouTube, you're not limited. No, I was talking about pals that want to hang out with him and pick his pocket. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that's, that's just crazy. That really is crazy. But that is, but, but what, so, so like Ronnie Dangerfield, you know, worked so hard, built up this persona, wrote these jokes, worked with people like you, built up, you know, again, this, this, I mean, on, right, and on some the kid sneezes show. on himself on YouTube, and all of a sudden, he's, you know, more people know him. Yeah. Know. So, what do you think is going to happen? Like, just the nature of media. And, I think and most fame of us comedians changing. are going to kill ourselves, is what I think. It's just really, I think that's the only way out. You know, I know. I, you know, I have no idea. What's the funniest thing is that the, the most astute person of all was was Andy Warhol when he said, "In the future, everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes." Who knew that he was overshooting? Right. You know, 15 minutes, you know, it's like sex. How do you make it last that long, you know? So, but but with you then, like after Rodney Dangerfield, you know. He was only a teeny, right. teeny piece of me. I, it got, that got blown up by Howard so much to make a big deal out of it. But, you know. But I, Howard's I, the really I, big I, part. Oh, he was the, the, the main thing for me. But I, I mean, I wrote some stuff for Rodney and had incredible, incredible, funny, funny Stories. Tell, tell me one of your uh, Ronnie Dangerfield jokes. Well, there's nothing that's not off color. That's okay. It's okay. The, the worst, the worst Ronnie Dangerfield story I ever heard, and I wasn't there, was there was a guy named John Fox who passed away, and uh, he, Rodney was making a movie, a, a, an animated film called Rover Dangerfield, and it was a dog, and the dog had a pal, and the pal was going to be John Fox, this friend of mine. I worked with him all over the country. And uh, they got a penthouse in Las Vegas to write this movie. And 
they're up in the penthouse and they decide to go down to the gambling tables and they got on the elevator. John said it was just him and Rodney on the way down the elevator and halfway down the elevator door opened and a little tiny Asian woman got in the elevator next to him. She's this tall. And he said, and the elevator door closed and on the way down, he said, Rodney blasted the loudest, most disgusting fart he'd ever heard in his life. And when they got to the bottom, the doors opened. There's like 100 people waiting to get in the elevator. And, and as he walking out the door, Rodney turned to the little woman and said, you're really fucking disgusting, you know? <laughs> now, the, why that's so funny is he's a 75-year-old man, and, but he's like 12, you know? And that, that's, the, that's the beauty of being a comic, because you do that stuff. You know, you do silly stuff like that. You know, I, I had one... I interviewed Rodney Dangerfield in 1996 at the Aspen Comedy Festival. And the first question I asked him was just kind of off the cuff, what's, what's the strangest thing you've ever seen at three in the morning? I swear to God, he didn't hesitate for even one second, one second, even less than a second. He said, her husband came home. <laughs> and that's so clever, like just to, that's, you know. He's that, but he was that, you know, he wasn't that funny. So he, he, he could have just, well, had nothing to say. It's really funny. Like so many really big guys, he could be really funny, but he could, he could sometimes have no sense of humor at all, which is, which is really fun. You know, well, when, I, when what, I first was going away with him, when, when we we're putting the stuff in the car, I said, you have to realize that I'm gonna laugh every time you open your mouth. <laughs> yeah, I have a party, what do I care? You know, the, my, my best Rodney story, is uh, he took me with him uh, in 1980. We, we, I, I badgered him. I said, look, he's, I'm selling you jokes. Take me with you on the road. We'll have fun. Take me on the road. We'll have fun. And uh, finally, he said, all right, all right, we'll go. We'll go. Come on, you come to Lauderdale, we'll have a vacation, and we'll go to, it's on me, blah, blah, blah. So it's pretty magnanimous. This was in 1980, and there was a gasoline strike, a, a national gasoline strike. People weren't even going to the next town, let alone going to Las Vegas. And Las Vegas was a ghost town. And his, his rooms were like, you know, the, his shows were like one quarter, one third full. I'll, I'll tell you something about show business. It was a real eye opener for me and it, not a good one. Because I'm with this, he was a major star. This is a major comic that everybody knows, everybody loves. And, you know, they pick us up at the airport, the Aladdin Hotel picks us up at the, in their limo and we come to the Aladdin and we get out to go into the hotel and the first thing he does is he runs to the box office and asks how sales are. Like he's concerned. And I'm like, holy shit, it, it never changes. You know, you would think at a certain level of celebrity, you don't give a shit, you know, you're gonna pack them in and you're a star and what difference is it? Hey, how's sales, hey, we doing, how we doing? So how's the late show, okay, you know? Which was kind of weird. You, it, was that out of insecurity? Oh, please, oh, please. So, so it's a good point, though. Like, how do you think, can you separate success from that insecurity? No, no, but that's not the point of the story. So, so the place is empty, and it's, he's done with his two shows, and uh, oh, it was so much fun. I, I, you know, the stories line up in your head. He said, come on, look, look, let's go have some fun. Let's go have some fun. So we, at this time, 1980, uh, it's Easter time. The MGM Grand, before it burnt down, was the next hotel over. It was still pretty far away. It's the Las Vegas Boulevard, major hotels. So we walked down to the uh, MGM Grand, and the place is empty. I mean, it's empty. No hookers, no nothing. And the Major D is there, and he's known Rodney for decades. So the Major D is calling Rodney. He's calling him Roger Danglefoot. And every time he says it, I'm peeing, and it's pissing Rodney off and making that guy laugh harder, you know. So come on, let's get out of here, let's get out of here. So we leave and we're walking up Las Vegas Boulevard to the Aladdin. It's late at night and you know, we really had a good time of it. And the sun is like about to come up and we were whacked. And we just about get to the Aladdin and he turns to me and he goes, you gotta take a leak? And I said, yeah, you know how much I drink a lot of beer. Of course, I can always piss, you know. He goes, come on, and instead of, waiting and going into the Aladdin, into the lobby and going into the bathroom. We walk behind where there's these major dumpsters the size of a small McDonald's. And he walks up to one of the dumpsters 
and starts peeing on the dumpster. So what am I going to do? I'm over here, and I start peeing on this dumpster, and we're in the middle of taking a leak, and he turns to me and says, welcome to the big time. That's funny. <laughs> and I thought, I thought that, was, that was the quintessential Rodney. Well, yeah. what, what jokes were you writing for him then? Like, tell us uh, a joke that you wrote for him that he performed. Uh, the reason he liked me was I sold him a joke. It was an old Southern expression and I got it by way of a friend who was in Peru, misbehaving, blah, blah, blah. And it, it, you got to get my book because it's a very long story, but it's a fun story. But the bottom line is I typed up a bunch of pages for him because a friend said that he met him and befriended him and he was going to be on his show. And then it turned out he was lying. And I already typed up all these pages. So I just fold them up and put them in an envelope. And it was so funny because my friend said, I didn't meet Rodney. I, I, you know, I didn't even get on stage at Dangerfield. He said, but I was there and he took out a matchbook and he had the address of Dangerfield. So I wrote it on the envelope and sent it. And the joke that my friend had called me with that's very funny was one of them. And he instantly fell in love with the joke until the day he died. It was the funniest joke I ever had. You know, I owe you, you know, it was a good joke. And the joke I sold him was the girl was so ugly, she was known as a two bagger. That's a girl who's so ugly, you not only got to put a bag over her head, you got to put a bag over your own head in case her bag rips. Okay, which is a highly insulting, horrible, look at the Me Too generation, like, fuck you. <laughs> but, but it was a killer. And then Johnny Carson went off of his seat when Rodney told him, you know, and he never forgot that. You know? Well, and you know, people, there's nothing like Johnny Carson right now. So jo if Johnny Carson had a comedian on, like, and Rodney Dangerfield was probably on more than any other comedian, they were friends, which was an odd thing for Johnny Carson. That comedian was like blessed by the gods. Like he would get movies, shows, whatever he wanted. And again, Rodney Dangerfield was on like 20, 30 times Rodney or more. was on there 70 times and he probably never had two words of social interaction with Carson. Huh. It's, it's the show business is ugly. And the more you learn about it, it's too late and you're already in it. And you find out what turds these people are. You know, he was so rude and crappy to Rodney that when they were doing... Carson's final two shows, they asked Rodney to be on, and he said, go. Really? He said, go scratch, you know. So like, he never did, nobody did it. People don't do stuff for each other. When you're young and scrambling, I help you, you help me, you know. I come to Middle Jersey City for you, you know what I mean? We're two young people. <laughs> That's the only way to play it, you know. I agree. I'm, I'm 71 going on 32. So, so uh, you know, you went from, well, first I want to ask, Ronnie Dangerfield, he had this persona where he was down and out. And you said since 15, he'd been developing that persona. Like, I've got, got no respect. Nobody likes me. I'm ugly. Whatever. Eddie Murphy's like the opposite of that. He was so confident. Pompous and right. And it was almost like his, his confidence and his observation and his ability to, hey, we're all smarter than everyone else. That was his yeah, humor. the cock of the walk, you know, and it was great. And, and I feel like great. Dangerfield, I feel like Eddie Murphy gets dated. Like, if you go back and listen to Raw now, it's dated. But I can listen to Dangerfield and those old Carson clips, and it's still funny. Rodney, he's like Kenny Youngman. Like, the, the, the jokes just transcend because, you know, they're downtrodden. And and he he developed into that persona, you know. He was just telling regular jokes. His first job was a, he was a singing waiter in Brooklyn, and his, the, the maitre, maitre d was Lenny Bruce's mother. She gave, Lenny Bruce's mother gave Rodney his first job as a singing waiter, which is just, which is just stupid trivia. And, uh, and he just did his jokes and did his jokes and he was getting nowhere and he started selling aluminum siding because he wanted to feed his family. And then he said the hell with it and went back into it, you know, and, uh, and set up Dangerfield's comedy club so he wouldn't have to leave town so he could take care of his kids, you know. And, uh, and he's a character. You know, and he, he just worked and worked and worked and worked. And, you know, the classic, the harder he worked, the luckier he got. You know what I'm saying? It's, you know, he, he was no overnight success, that's for sure. You know? Well, you know, the same could be said for Howard Stern. Like, he was kind of failing at his first two local markets. Oh, he, he really paid his dues. He went from here to there to here to there, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, but then that's, started... that's what's crazy when you hear that somebody sneezed on Facebook and there's 5 million people following them. And when you know how many people, you know, worked and worked and worked. You know, X, I mean, there's X amount of people that get on a television show when they're 12 years old and get famous. 
you know, but they're dead by 18. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's a, it's a, it's a, the business is a whore, you know, it's horrible. No, you've said that I, a lot. I, said, I feel I like, said, are you a little better about the business? Like, no, but no, you know what it is? Not even a little, I love it. I, you know, I couldn't even envision. It was so funny because I was 31 and, 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 you know, I wasn't a good guitar player. I wasn't a good songwriter, but art is such an odd thing because how much you love something and how much you put into it doesn't have any relevance to how well you're doing. You know, I mean, I was in it great guns, body and soul. I, I, I love my songs. I love my music. I was into it. I stunk, but, but, but who cared? I was so, so into it. And it's just a, such a love. And when I realized, wait a minute, if I ever want to eat, you know, I'm making $80 a week on a good week and I'm 31 years old, I'm a college graduate. It never went through my mind, maybe I should get a regular job. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think I've ever, maybe three times in my life I've ever said it out loud like that. I mean, the, the, it was like, heavens forbid. And I, I said, well, look, I know all these jokes. Let me try telling these jokes on stage. And they laughed and I told more and they laughed some more and they made an album and that, you know, I didn't go, you know, I went like this. I mean, I was crawling and crawling and then I, uh, me and my uh, soon to be wife started hosting the shows at Governor's Comedy Shop on Long Island. And we created that whole thing and I was starting shows. So by producing the shows, but I was, and then, you know, I sent my albums to Howard and he called me up and I went in and sat in on the show and they said, you're a lot of fun, come back next week. And I worked there once a week for free for three years. I mean, I put in, paid my dues, you know? And it was, so it was gradual, gradual, gradual. And eventually, all of a sudden, I'm rich. You know, I'd look at my wallet and I'd freak out. And my wife would say, what's wrong with you? I said, look at the $100 bills. And she said, well, calm down. I said, listen, if you go 40 years without having a $100 bill in your wallet, I'm still allowed to get excited about it. To this day, if I open a wallet, I say, well, who stuck this in my pocket? Well, I think, though, an important lesson is that you were willing to do it for free for three years. I think people aren't willing to put in the free. Well, you know, it's... it's it's a vision, and that sounds pompous too, but you know, it was WNBC in New York City, you know, 50,000 watts, the whole world is listening. You, know, you get pulled over by a cop, oh, I heard you on the Howard Stern show, get out of here, you know, little things like that, but the whole world was listening and I was producing shows at Governor's Comedy Shop and, and my stand-up shows, you know, it, so it was paying off in spades you know, I was selling out shows and making more and more money, more and more money. And then when we went to mornings and I became salaried, I had finagled myself into where I was passing them notes and making them noticeably funnier. And then we just caught, it was just like we caught on, the, you know, a, a tiger's tail and just went zoom, you know. I mean, Howard, the, what, you look at his interviews and now with his new book, uh, Howard Stern Comes Again, it's kind of the transcripts of those interviews. So you could really study the guy's amazing as an interviewer, and he always has But he been. always was. He yeah. always was. People say, oh, wow, when did he learn to do I th always thought he was a great interviewer. You know, he's like he used to help with the questions he's fearless. and stuff. Huh? He's fearless. He'll, he'll ask anybody anything. But then you, you started handing him notes. Like, so what's an example where you were like, ah, oh, this could be, he could do this a little funnier, and you... No, what, what it was, there's no, there's no way to give you an actual example, but it's like if you were in a conversation with him, and the two of you guys, I don't like him. You're talking to him. But you're having a conversation, and I'm supposed to be a reasonably funny guy. So the three of us are sitting at a table, and you say something relatively amusing. You say something amusing, blah, blah, blah. And I think of something amusing to add to the conversation. Instead of saying it, I write it down and put it here. So he's saying what he thinks is funny, and you're saying what you think is funny. But you're also getting to say what I think is funny. So all of a sudden, you've got another brain working for you. And, and I'm a funny guy. And all of a sudden, he's saying things out of the blue that were crazy funny. I tell people, he's driving the bus, so he can't read the map. If you're driving, you can't read the map. So he's driving. And I'm thinking of things and ways to go and, and punchline, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, there's a punchline. And 
for 15 years, he never had to worry. It's like going to a bar and knowing somebody had your back. You want to start all the fights you want, you know, like he knew no matter what, if he looked over here, this is going to be something really funny to say, which, which, you know, pumps you up and makes you big. And not only that, when he first started, you know, he was rude and crazy. I mean, that was his persona and uh, grading. But if you can talk like that and be wild and be a pain in the ass, but then you pop it with a punchline and say something funny, everything goes away and you start over. So it'd be that, 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 ba boom. Ha <laughs> It sounds weird, but it just would, it just make everything much more palatable. But, you know? and, and I hate to always bring it to a lesson, but I'm learning from what you're saying. You, a lot of people would say, oh, I'm funny, so I'm gonna, I wanna say the jokes. I want people to think I'm funny. You didn't, you didn't have like a scarcity complex about the abundance of your jokes. You were freely giving the guy driving the bus to make him look good, and that's how you rode that bus. I, I couldn't or wouldn't do it, you know? I, that wasn't something I could do. I, I could write for that character that he was, but it's not stuff I ever would say myself. You know, everything in my act is like old jokes and craziness, and I never did old jokes on the show. You know, I very rarely, once in a while I pop in and say an old joke, but I'm writing things for him, you know, on the fly, like we're in motion. It's and it'll like be a, something funny to say or a different way to go or an idea to do this. And it was really creative and really fun. And it never bothered me that he was getting the laughs. Cause when, when I heard the, you know, I, a lot of the laughs were coming from me and I was, I would roar because we had a great, great, great show as a team, you know, you know, if Mickey Mantle's hitting the home runs and, and you're playing first base and, and, catching a ball to put people out and you go to the World Series, you know, it's our team. You know, I, 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 for some reason, the ego of it never bothered me even a little bit, you know. So, so you know, fast forwarding to 2001, you know, everybody's in contract negotiations. Here you had this huge philosophy that worked for you of three years for free. Let's give Howard as much credit as possible. Let's give him the, the overabundance of, of jokes and, and so on. What happened then in 2001? I, it, it, it's the classic thing of you're working for a boss and you think you should get paid more and he doesn't. You know, I asked for more money and they said no. I mean, the whole world is at a field day trying to make something crazy out of something. But there was no animosity. There's no, I mean, there was so many factors. There's a million reasons why you ask your boss for more money or, or you're ready to walk. And uh, I had plenty of reasons, but I drew a line in the sand and said, this is how much I, I want to make. And they said no. You know, so I'm allowed to ask and they're allowed to say no. You know, it's like being in the back seat with a girl. It's that simple, you know? And and Artie Lang came on the show. You left the show Much Artie later, Lang. much later. People say, oh, did you and Artie get along? Me and Artie, I knew him forever. And he didn't sit in my chair until eight months after I was gone. You know, there was no crossover whatsoever. What, what was his role really on the show compared I, to you your know, role? I never listened. I didn't know. But I, as far as I know, he wasn't writing jokes. He was telling stories and hanging out and, you know, it, it was a different role. Yeah, because he had kind of the down and out thing as well. Like he had his problems, he would tell jokes, he would I, tell stories I didn't from listen. I, you know, I, I never, I didn't listen to the show when I was on it and I didn't listen to the show after I left it. And, you know, people, so many people, oh, you're, you're full of it, you listen. I, I, I don't. If I turn that show on and it's funny, I'll feel bad. And if I turn it on, it's not funny, I'll feel bad. So there's no win, you know. He's not funny without me there. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable, 
pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmaine.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James, that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. These days, we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. You've worked with all these comedians. You tell all these jokes. You said you've known thousands of jokes since you were a kid. What for you is like the essence of a joke? I know, yeah, I know there's no formula. You know, I you know, know there's what? no formula. Jokes and comedy, are, are, it's an entity that the minute you talk about it or discuss it, it ceases to be funny. There's nothing funny about talking about comedy. I mean, there's no, what is the essence, blah, 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 blah. You know, whatever works, whatever makes somebody laugh and, and what makes you laugh at one point in space and time isn't going to work on them or this. And... I'd love to say you get a sense of it, but then I go out and do the same act every place. I don't care if there's a room full of nuns, so it doesn't matter. But uh, there how, is, how does the room full of nuns react? Oh, they love me. They love me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They, they leave so fast. I don't know. <laughs> but um, there is there is no rhyme, no reason, you know. And 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 you never get spoiled, you know. Every it's there's a new movie out about Pavarotti, Pavarotti, and. Uh, and this, you know, trailers going around in little ads and, you know, with snippets of people talking. And one of the things that one of the guys says is, 
he was a he was a wreck before every show and like people are like that's impossible of course he was every every professional if you're not nervous or concerned before you do your show you're in the wrong business like i i i sit there like for before the show and i'm like this is going to be the night that they realize that i'm no good you know chris rock said it best he said comedians don't get paid for doing the show they get paid for the 15 minutes before the show huh. because you sit there like what what makes you think you're going to walk out there and say something that all these people are going to laugh at you know it's there's, there's it's crazy it, the, the, the the concept of one person saying something that all these people of all different you know everything are going to laugh at is absurd but it works and it's fun you know you have you have that joke that if you call the phone line right now today it's on there it's the one you told to Paul in the book. You told you told this joke to Paul McCartney. Can you tell that joke? Yeah, I want to tell that story. You know, I found out uh, like 20 years ago that Paul McCartney was a big joke fan. You know, and, and you know, just like some people like professional football and there's Jets fans, and some people like baseball, and some people like the opera, and some people like jokes. And people that like jokes are a breed. You know, like if you're a Jet fan and I'm a Jet fan and we meet, we got a getting off place. And people that tell jokes and love jokes love to meet other joke tellers for the main reason that maybe you're going to get a new joke out of it. And it's and it's a fun thing. And when I found that out, because Noel Redding from the old Jimi Hendrix experience used to come on the Stern show and he said, oh, Jack, we had such a good time. The wife and I we were out with Paul and Linda. I'm like, yeah, what'd you do? No, oh, we told jokes. We told filthy jokes all night. I'm like invite me to dinner you son of a bitch invite me i know mccartney would love me and howard would argue with me oh he would hate you you're a jerk but i said listen i know if i told him two jokes he'd be mine if if somebody's a joke teller and they know you got funny stuff it's like a drug deal they just know and they, but nobody if you're not in that if you're not in that swing you, it's hard to explain but so my whole life, so though everybody I know knows, I always want to tell McCartney jokes. I've gone to concerts and been in the green room and waiting and for, I'd missed them for whatever reason, just pissed me off. And so my girlfriend and I went to a screening of uh, the big short and it was a highfalutin screening. It was at the MoMA and we're downstairs and it was Tina Fey and Lorne Michaels. And there was, you know, we shouldn't have been there. I have no idea how the hell I was there. And there's all these famous people and people that you, think you should know well, who were they 20 years ago and so we're standing there and McCartney and his wife Nancy come down the stairs and my girlfriend says Jackie it is Paul McCartney you can tell him a joke tell him a joke I said listen Barbara that's the beauty of New York City if you're Woody Allen or if you're Paul McCartney you can walk around because nobody's going to bother you. Maybe not. He can't. Maybe Paul McCartney can't walk. Woody can walk on the street. Paul can't maybe walk on the street. But Paul McCartney can come into a show business party like that because he knows people are going to leave him alone. Because there's not a person in the room that didn't have a perfectly good reason to go up and tell Paul McCartney exactly what they were doing in 1964. And trust me, he doesn't give a shit. OK, so I give this whole spiel about, yeah, it's really nice. But no, 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 no. So we're on the outskirts of the party and Paul and Nancy come walking around the perimeter of the room and they walked, I'm talking in front of my nose and his wife, Nancy walked right past my nose and all of a sudden here's McCartney, right? And I swear, I don't even know what happened. I just also just put my hand on his lapel and he turned to me and I said, can I tell you a joke? And he said, sure. And I told him a joke and he roared but he kept going. He didn't say, oh, I got one for you, which would, you know, forget it. But this is a joke I told him. The guy goes for a job interview and the interviewer says, what do you think is your biggest fault? And the guy says, I think my biggest fault is my honesty. And the interviewer says, I, I don't think honesty is a fault. And the guy says, I don't give a fuck what you think. <laughs> <laughs> and I told Barbara, I said, as he's walking away, he's telling that joke to himself in his head. And he's going to tell that 10 times in the next two days. So he'll have it cemented in his head. And it was, and it was like, you know, and it was wonderful. So that's one of my bucket list things. And I trade jokes on, on email with Willie Nelson. And he's in my documentary sitting at telling jokes back and forth. And you know, the people that love him, love him, you know, 
It's just, it's, a, it's an odd little calling, but I do it. And uh, you were on The Aristocrats, too, which is the, describe that one, because Gilbert Gottfried's been on the podcast. The, um, the Aristocrats was a joke that I heard way back in, uh, in like, I guess, 78 or 79. It was told to me by a British magician comedian whose name is Martin Lewis, which I always thought was the greatest name. And he, we roared when we heard the joke and instantly became my famous favorite joke. And I'm telling it around. And I had, you know, the stories are too long and involved, but I became a pen pal of this incredibly nut, this incredible nut who went around the world collecting jokes and he had these two huge books. His name is Gershon Legman. And one of his books was actually featured in The Aristocrats. And meanwhile, The Aristocrats is my favorite joke. And I'm telling it to people. It, comedians weren't telling. There's there a little hogwash in there. You know, nobody, there's a few of us that told jokes, but not a lot of people. But I would tell that joke to people. And uh, for the longest time, and I was a big fan of this guy, Legman, but his books were crazy. And they were thick. And they were like the Bible. So you could only read a few pages at a time. And one day I discovered that The Aristocrats was the last joke on the last page of the second book is on volume two, which I went crazy. And this guy, Gershon Legman, this is pretty astute. His whole theory about jokes was about humor. He said that you're totally defined by what you think is funny. And that is, and, and if you think about it, it it's, it's amazing. It's just amazing. And then I read the aristocrat joke, but he describes it a joke that was told him by a guy who was raised in a family of horror where the parents battled for 40 years, but they didn't get a divorce because they wanted to stay together for the good of the children. And I'm like, I'm reading my life story. And then this guy tells the joke. So that was way, way long ago. So in 1998, when I put out my joke book with Simon and Schuster, I made the aristocrats, the last joke on the last page in homage to my friend Legman. And then 20 years later, they make this movie. And if you look at the poster of that movie, I don't belong. It, it, like the names on the poster are staggering. And then out of nowhere, Jackie the Joke Man Martling, they're all five times, 10 times more famous than me. But Penn Gillette and Paul Provenza came to me and said, we have to put you in the movie because we did a search on the aristocrats on the web and we only got two hits. And they were both your website because I had my version of joke and I had Gershon Legman's version of joke. And I'm like, I was steeped in the lore of that joke, you know, 15 years before it even uh, entered their mind. So, so just to describe the, the, the joke, the, the movie is all these comedians are telling the same joke, but in, it, like the joke was sort of a skeleton of what a joke. It, what it is, is it, yeah, I'm sure you all know a shaggy dog story where you can just tell the story with it. This actually has a punchline, but it's, it's, you can fill it in and make it long and long and as long as you want. You know, it's like Larry the Boil Sucker or the Shaggy Dog. And, uh, and so, and like anything else, it has diminishing returns. You can make, you get real, people get really gross and then it's a stupid joke. And the point of the movie, people are going on and on and on, getting really filthy and really disgusting, really crazy. But it, it, to me, it loses it. You know, you can only go... You know, you only give so much meat and then you got to get to the end, you know. But, but it's an interesting movie and they do it all kind of different ways. And it was, uh, it was a thrill to do it. It was, it was really fun. So when, when's your documentary? When do you think that's going to be done, finished, it, coming it, it, out? He promised me in the fall. We just scored Mark Cuban. Believe it or not, I did Mark Cuban a solid. You, you know, time moves on so fast. In 1995... You know, there was the internet and it was text. And then there was the World Wide Web. And then they were putting pictures on the web. And then they were putting audio on the web. And then they were putting video on, but that all, all that was very slow in coming. And because in the early days, a lot of people had 14.4 uh, bits per second on AOL or whatever. And you know, you'd be there forever just having a story load, let alone a picture. And uh, so everything moved very slow. And Mark Cuban had already made money. I, I'm just assuming you people know who he is. And he, he had already made money. And he moved to Dallas and got the bright idea that they wanted to put, foot, uh, put basketball games on the web. They wanted to stream live basketball games, which was a big concept, to stream live audio back then. 
And the Stern Show had just started in Dallas. We were popping into, you know, Miami, Chicago, Denver, you know, we were taking, you know, we we're printing money. They were printing money. They shared a little of it. And uh, so they called me from Dallas and said, hey, we have this company, uh, audionet.com, and we love your jokes. We're big fans, and we'd love to have you come out here and do a show. Uh, we can't pay you. And I said, look, I'm going, you know, to Boston and Dallas, I mean, Boston and Denver, and, you know, I'm making a lot of money on the weekends, and I'm making a lot of money during the week, so it's a big deal to give up my weekend. You know, I love doing the comedy, but, you know, it, oh, you're burning the candle. You know how it is. And I said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send you my stuff. And I sent audionet.com everything I had, cassettes and CDs and videotape, and they took everything I had and made it into a long, like, like it, not physically a loop, but it was basically a long loop of all my material, about six hours worth. And they had that on, on the website. So if you listen to a basketball game or whatever you're doing, at any point you could push the button and the game would be interrupted by maybe a dirty joke, maybe a clean joke, maybe a stupid, whatever. But it was, it, you'd be just jumping in on this endless loop and they were thrilled, and I was thrilled because they promoted me, blah, 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 and then who knows what happened. And then a couple of years later, I see, yeah, AudioNet had merged, had, had morphed into broad, uh, Broadcast.com. Broadcast.com sold to Yahoo for $4 billion. And I'm like, whoa, you know, I, won't, I wonder if they remember me, you know. And he does, you know, and he's always been good to me. And I said, hey, you'd be in my documentary? He said, sure. And he actually told Howard about it. it was, I don't know how well anybody knows the show, but I left the show in 2001 and Mark Cuban was on the show in like 2003. And he knew, of course he knew I was on the show. And, uh, and he's sitting there and he goes, by the way, Howard, I gotta, I give, gotta give some credit to your boy Jackie here. He, uh, I mean, he really helped out when, when we needed content, he gave us content. You know, I, I might not be here without, you know, thank you, Jackie. And Howard goes, that's not Jackie, that's Fred. Jackie hadn't been here for two years. And he said, well, when, when Jackie was Jackie and they made a whole big joke about it, but meanwhile, it's Mark Cuban thanking me. So that's my Mark Cuban, and I think that's fun. You know, but once again, there's another, you know, two billionaires talking and having fun and, and I'm here <laughs> talking to you. Another billionaire. <laughs> I'll tell you a recent thing, without you asking. Uh, I save all, I save everything because it's fun, and I love knickknacks. And I used to produce shows and do whatever I could do. And there was a guy that put on shows in New Jersey, and he was putting on a show one night in uh, Fort Lee, New Jersey. And he asked me to host it. He said, "Jackie, I need you to MC because I can't be there." He was like he did greaseball DJ. You know, he, everybody's hustling to make money. So he says, uh, my father will give you the list. So his father came and set up the sound system and gave me this list <clears throat> of the comedian, <coughs> excuse me, of, <clears throat> of the comics to introduce. So I saved this list. For, it, you'll see why, because it was interesting. So just to show you how over I am, uh, I get a call from, it sounds like you're making it up as you go. I get a call from this guy, Dante, who's Ron Jeremy's manager. Ron Jeremy's a very famous porn star for obscene reasons. And he says, listen, I got an email and the email was a producer and said, hey, we want to use this piece of paper we found. And somebody said, yeah, it's owned by Jackie Martling. Do you know her? <laughs> so I'm like, oh boy, my life is over. So they contacted me and on the MC list, it doesn't have my name because I was the host. It had the names of the people on the show and they have Eddie Murphy and Jerry Seinfeld and Gilbert Gottfried and all three of the names are spelled wrong, which is probably why I kept the piece of paper. So I'm thrilled and I said, listen, Eddie Murphy is gonna be on Comedians in Cars getting coffee and they're, you know, they wanna talk about the old days and the Jade Fountain out on Route 17 and uh, <clears throat> that, you know, you're. MC list is so perfect and we'd like to use it. And I said, okay, make me an offer. You know, I'm a businessman. So the guy writes back uh, $600. So I emailed him back, let's review. <laughs> I said, a billionaire is going to interview another billionaire on a billion dollar network. 
and you want worldwide rights in perpetuity on any form of media they'll ever be for a priceless piece of comedy memorabilia, and you want to give me 600 bucks? What would you say? And the kid wrote back to me exactly what you said. I'll go ask for more money, okay? So he went back and he comes back and says, they're only going to give it as high as they'll go as $1,000. So of course my first thought is I'm going to tell them to shove it up their ass so far you can't see tomorrow. And I said, no, you're a comedian, you got to be funny. I said, you know what? Maybe I'll tell him to just go run and tell Jerry the good, good news that he just saved $1,000 because I'm not going to sell it to him for that. And I said, hell, what the hell? So I, and I took the money. So supposedly this month, Eddie Murphy is on Comedians in Cars getting coffee and wow. they allude to this piece of paper. And, and it's, it's fun, you know? And then I, I don't know why I saved something like that, but it was great, you know? And then I, I was, I was part of the gang back then, you know, they all got huge and I'm here talking to you still, <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah, I, it was fun. You probably insulted me about 15 times. No, it's okay. that's insulting. It's okay. It's okay. That's <laughs> insulting me, not you. The funny thing, the first 16 times we're even, it's okay. The, the 15, the, the first person on that list, on that MC list was a guy named Rich Gagliardi. And my girlfriend owns a talent agency and her and her partners, you know, sign comedians and musicians. And that guy, Rich Gagliardi, is now signed by all crazy coincidences to my girlfriend's company. Only his name is Julia Scotty. And you might have seen him on America's Got Talent. And he was, he's, he, she, strike me dead, I don't know. Whatever she is, she was great. And she's an old friend. And she got a sex change at like 64 years old, you know. Hmm. Just a delightful person. But the fact, there's no reason for her to be on that list than she just is, which just makes the story so fun, you know. So, so Jackie, there's so many things you've got. You've got the recent book, uh, Jackie, you know, The Joke Man, Bow to Stern. You've got your upcoming documentary. What's that going to be called? Joke Man. And just you, Joke Man. With Mark Cuban involved, like what is it going to be on one of his HD channels? Well, you no, know, he's just he's just going to get interviewed. But he, you know, he might put it up. Like I did. Uh, he he had a live comedy show from Gotham, from Gotham Comedy Club, uh, for years, and I did that three or four times. And he had me host the rep rounds, and it was a very dirty, very fun show. Really all the greatest comedians really letting loose and he's a good guy. So, but he, he never knows one minute it's all comedy on his network and the next minute there's no comedy at all. So he does, he kind of does what he wants, but uh, there'll be a lot of interesting people in this thing. And um, I, I look forward to doing just like this, like showing the documentary and then doing Q and A because people, the people's questions are always interesting. And you know me, somebody sneezes and I do 15 minutes. So I apologize for that. Well, Jackie, thanks so much for once again coming on the podcast. We're just getting started. Are we I, done? Na, yeah, we're going to do a comedy show here. That's so, bullshit, man. <laughs> um, when the documentary comes out, come on again. And uh, I, I would we'll love do to a live again. event at, at, at the club or here at next year's festival or whatever you want. If you would ever like to come out to a show, it's very, very naughty jokes, but I guarantee you'll laugh harder for an hour than you ever have. Just go to uh, jokeland.com. That's my website. And I tweet jokes at Jackie Martling, 4.20 p.m. International Marijuana Time every day. And, uh, and I have a mailing list. If you email, I'm still on AOL, jokeland at AOL.com. I send jokes once a month with my list of where I'm working. And uh, I've been doing the same thing forever, and I'm going to keep doing it forever. And, uh, and thanks for being here. Great. Well, thank you, Jackie, for coming on. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. 
So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.